Come on, come on. Come on. He's worthy of our best praise. The Bible says to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Does anybody got any victory in their voice? Praise God. I love him today. How about you? Are you glad to be in church today? Well, you look good. You sound good. And the Lord is in this place. And who knows what he's going to do. And yeah, you can be seated. You beat me to it. Matter of fact, I need you to stand one more. I'm just playing. <clears throat> but so delighted to be here and excited and just want to so we're going to jump right into the word. If you have your Bibles, matter, just open them up to the book of John chapter 16. John chapter 16. I'm going to go there, read uh, John chapter 16, and then I'll jump to James chapter 4 verse 5. Um, while you're turning there or punching there, I uh, just want to make this very clear. I am not a guest speaker. <laughs> okay, let's just, um, this is, I'm not a guest. I'm the... Brother from another mother, if I can say that. I just, I'm, 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 this is family. This is home. I just, we just have a house on the other side of the nation. <laughs> We're all in one house. We just have a different room. And so I'm um, glad to be here today. Um, I know there are many here. The new face is wonderful, amazing, beautiful, just congregation of so many people. God's doing great things here. It's so obvious. And, um, but I do want to say I'm, I'm, I'm Javon, and I've uh, been a part of Free Chapel for a long time. And, um, and um, so we're here today. That's all I'm going to say. I'm part of Free Chapel. My family's here with me today, Shanna, my two kids. And so we're glad to be here with this amazing team that God has put together here at Orange County. And so let's, let's, get, let's get in the Word, all right? You ready? I'm ready to go. Can you tell? <laughs> uh, John chapter 16. Um, today is Pentecost Sunday, and um, we, we believe in Pentecost. We celebrate Pentecost, but I want to say this, that we dare not minimize it to just uh, one Sunday, you know, out of the year. We believe every Sunday is Pentecostal Sunday. Amen? Amen. John chapter 16, verse 7. It says this, but, here, but here's the truth. These are the words of Jesus. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. It says, it is to your advantage that I go away. Notice that. For if I don't go away, it says this, the divine encourager. I love that. Or the helper or the Holy Spirit will not be released to you. But after I depart, I will send him to you. Isn't that good? He said, it's to your advantage that I go away. And then James chapter 4, verse 5 in the Passion Translation, it says this again. It says this. It says, does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit that God breathed into your hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us. Isn't that awesome about the Holy Spirit? An intense desire to have more and more of us. It's not a matter of how much of the Holy Spirit you have, but how much, uh, but how much the Holy Spirit have of you. I want to talk to you just from this simple subject. Take it from the text. I want to call it we have the advantage. We have the advantage. The great missionary E. Stanley Jones, um, who was a great missionary to India, was reflecting on his years of missionary work, and he wrote this. He said, I came to India with this conviction, and the years I've done nothing but verify it. It is this. Pentecost is not a luxury. It is an utter necessity for human living. The human spirit fails unless the Holy Spirit feels. We are shut up to the alternative, Pentecost or failure. Now understand by that phrase, he didn't mean that we had to join a particular denomination or a certain move, but rather that we need the same experience, being filled with the Spirit like the early believers at Pentecost. The success of our Christian life and the impact of our ministry 
and what God has called us to do and the life he's called us to live is directly reflected or, or is key to our relationship with the Holy Spirit. In the book of John 14, 15, go back and read. I encourage you to 14, 15, 16, and 20. The Holy Spirit is emphasizing to the uh, Jesus is emphasizing the work of the Holy Spirit to the disciples and how critical he is to their lives. And I want to say he, the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not a thing. It's not goosebumps. I got those at rap concerts and I knew it wasn't the Lord. I'm just telling you, come on, somebody. So let's not, let's not, not, let's not, you know, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit cannot cause a physical reaction or an emotional reaction, but please don't reduce him down to just that. Understand the Bible said that Jesus was seen 40 days after his resurrection. 10 days later, the scripture said there they were in the upper room, 120 believers, and there the Holy Spirit filled that room, came as the sound of a rushing mighty wind and filled them with the Holy Spirit, the scripture said. What I want you to understand that Jesus made it very clear. He said, it is to your advantage. Isn't that something? He said, it's to your advantage. But think about what that meant to the disciples at that point in time. They couldn't quite gra um, wrap their mind about, around that statement. How can you say that it's our advantage? You've been with us. You've walked with us. You've, talked, uh, you've taught us. We've seen you move. We've seen you work miracles. You've been with us through our ups and downs and our ins and outs. How is it that you're saying that it's better off or to our advantage that you leave us? They didn't understand that what Jesus was trying to get them to realize that he himself was limited in a physical state as they knew him. They didn't see, watch this, that this transition that was about to take place was actually going to move them and take them to another level. I put it like this in my notes. I wrote it down. Jesus was saying that if there was no departure, there can't be a deposit. If there's no separation, there won't be an impartation. If there is no leaving, there can't be a coming. If there's no releasing, they can't, there can't be a receiving. He was saying there's some things that are going to have to go in order for some things to come. And that's a principle in and of itself in life. Sometimes in our life, there are some things that you, before you can grab a hold of, there's some things you got to let go of. And Jesus said, if you want this deposit, I've, there has to be a departure. If you want this next level, if you want to step in to what I have for you on a greater level, it's going to require a transition that I no longer be with you in this form but what he was saying was and what you have to understand he said that's why he used the word it is to your advantage don't look don't I want don't want you to think that now you're going to be some less likely now that you're going to be some second class Christian he said this, he said, I did not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. He was saying, I won't leave you without identity. I won't leave you without security. I won't leave you without stability. That is not my heart. Because understand something about believers. Let me just say this right here. We as believers, as the church of the living God, we are not some poor, pitiful people. I just, I, I, I got to get here. We are not some crazy, weak-minded people who use Christianity as a crutch because we can't do anything better in life. I'm, gonna pray. I'm coming. I'm coming. I feel it. I'm coming. We are not victims as the church of the living God. As Christians, we are not victims. We are victors. The Bible says, thanks be unto God who gives you and I the victory through Christ Jesus. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver them out of all. If God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in you and me than he that's in the world. The Lord is on our side. Whom shall we fear? What can man do unto me? Come on, somebody. We are not some beat down, broke down people. I refuse to settle with that mindset and label that even the world would try to put on us. But the Lord said that we are triumphant and victorious. 
He did not shed his blood. He did not hang on the cross. He didn't take a crown in his head and pierced in his side and beating on his back and go down into a grave for three days and rise up on the third day and bust through and left grave holes behind just for us to walk around as some poor pitiful people. The devil is a lie. We are the church triumphant. I'm not saying that your life is perfect. I'm not saying that everything is all together. But what I am saying, you're not walking to victory. You're walking from victory. God has already made you victorious. It is to your advantage. My people aren't disadvantaged. They're advantaged. You don't know where I come from, Pastor Javon. You don't know what my background is. You don't know my pedigree. I didn't grow up with this, and I didn't grow up with that. I didn't have this, and I didn't have that. Well, guess what? Welcome to life. Because there's 20 other people in here that can say the same thing. But the Bible says, if there, in, if there be any man in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Come on, somebody. The Bible says right now we have been raised with Christ Jesus and seated in heavenly places. Understand, he said, it's to your advantage when the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit let me give you this when it talks about the advantage and it talks about the Holy Spirit coming oftentimes the Bible gives us types and shadows of what the Holy Spirit oper how he operates and works in our life number one of those types and shadows is rain the Holy Spirit comes as rain in the progressive revelation of the Bible, we see that the rains, listen, that rains are heavy with, with meaning throughout the scripture. God's people were asked, were asked, God's people were to ask the Lord for rain, the Bible said in Zechariah 10.1. The Holy Spirit through the prophet Joel reveals that these rains, listen to this, are types and shadows of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What do you mean in Joel chapter 2? This is what Peter quoted and, pro uh, and proclaimed on the day of Pentecost. Joel chapter 2, it says this, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice for the Lord your God. He has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. Listen, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors, I'll explain it in a minute, shall be full of wheat. And the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. Verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, when I, what I sent among you. And then verse 28, it says, it shall come to pass that afterward, same chapter, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and on my maid servants and men servants I will pour out my spirit now let me pull it all together for you when it's talked about rain, there's a dual, duality in meaning. There's a dual meaning here. When it first talked about rain, first the rain represents refreshing, where there has been dryness, where there has been barrenness, the scripture said. The pouring out that Peter refers to, he's talking about the latter rain and the former rain. Understand when the scripture said the former rain and the latter rain, in the agricultural times of the Old Testament, there were two major times that the rain would come. And when the former rain, watch this, the former rain would fall, that was to prepare the ground for the seed. But when the latter rain would fall, it was to prepare, watch this, or hasten the harvest. And what God said, he said, I'll cause, watch this, where normally there was a significant time between the two an extended time between the two. But he said, according to this scripture, there would be a time that I caused the latter rain and the former rain to fall in the same month. 
In other words, I will expedite things in your life. What took 10 years, I can cause it to only take 10 days. What took 30, come on somebody, could have took 30 years. I can do it in only three weeks. And he said, when the rain comes, it has the ability to expedite things. I'll call both to rain, rains to fall in the same month. And notice what it said. It brought forth refreshing to dryness and barrenness. When I talk about refreshing and dryness and barrenness, I'm not just talking about maybe being backslidden or in sin, but sometimes spiritually we go through dry seasons. I, 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 sometimes that, that, that even back east, and I know here you have a lot of rain this year, but back east sometimes we'll go days without rain and our grass will begin to turn brown. It'll turn this weird color. But, but, but if you look at it, it looked like it's dead. If you look like at it, it looked like it's done. But all it takes is about a, come on, about a five-minute shower of rain to hit that grass. And it amazes me how quick it greens up. All I'm trying to tell you, that one moment in the presence of the Holy Spirit, one encounter with the Spirit of God, one word, one worship song, one person laying hands on you can take what looked like was over and done and bring new life again. The Holy Spirit will bring the rain of refreshing to your life if you will allow him. Can I just preach like I feel it? He said it'll be refreshing and that it'll also be restoration. Notice he said, I'll restore the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locusts have eaten. You got to get this about restoration, especially biblical restoration. Galatian puts it like this. I'll give you an example. It says that when your brother is overtaken in a fault, ye that are spiritual, restore him with a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. I love that scripture because it said, uh, 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 I love it. Consider yourself. When you are restoring somebody, do it with meekness. Do it with humility. And it says, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. In other words, don't you get so self-righteous and high and mighty and condescending and don't think this couldn't happen to you. Okay, I I'm going to go over here. Because sometimes, yeah, 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 sometimes we have the audacity to look down at people as if your stuff don't sting. But you ain't always been saved. I'm not being ugly. But what we got to remember, if you're going to look down, look down to lift somebody up. Because the Bible said, do it with humility and have a heart that says, that could be my family. That could be my child. That could be my brother. That could be me. And the way I want to be restored, I'm going to restore them. It's a medical term they were using. It speaks of a broken bone. And when they restored it, they would put that bone back into its original place. But here's the beauty of it. The bone, when it healed, would be stronger in the place that it was broken prior to it being broken. So when it is restored and put back into its proper place, it will be stronger then than it was before. Because see, that's biblical restoration. Biblical restoration is not getting you back to where you were. Biblical restoration is getting you beyond where you were. God just don't want to get you back up on your feet. He wants you to get up on your feet and run again. And come on, somebody. God cannot just get you back where you were. He can get you beyond where you were. He cannot... He, oh. In other words, he, I'm going to go ahead and preach this. He may not just get you a job this time. He may turn you into an entrepreneur this time. You go from an employee to an employer. Come on, somebody. That's the God you stir. He'll take you beyond. The Bible said when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord turned his captivity and gave him double. Understand something. The second thing there is refreshing and restoration. The second thing is the Holy Spirit comes as a river. What do you mean, Javon? Rivers are channels and conduits to places where the refreshing of water is needed. In Ezekiel chapter 47, the prophet came to a river that flowed from the temple. 
It was a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit and the move of the Holy Spirit. Three things it said. It said, number one, the river healed. The river made the sea water pure when it flowed into it. Number two, the river revived. Everything the river touched was transformed with his life-giving power. Number three, the river brought fruitfulness. Everywhere this great river flowed, fruit sprang up. What am I trying to tell you? I'm telling you that the river of the Holy Spirit can heal. It can come and heal in this place this morning. If you allow it to flow in your life, it can heal the broken heart. It can heal your soul. It can heal your body this morning. I believe in a God. It can heal broken lives. It can heal broken situations. But then it said the Holy Spirit comes and revive. It comes where it seems like things are dead and gone. On. One thing that it just 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 keeps ugh, eating at me is just to declare that the Holy Spirit wants to revive dead dreams. The things some of you have given up on stuff. Some of you have laid things down. It's been hard. It's been tough. You've went through seasons and seemingly it's not going to happen, but you got the right service today. You got the right person today. Don't you dare let that thing die. I come right now in the name of the Lord with, a, with, with spiritual, uh, what the, them shockers right now, to put on your dream and the Holy Spirit said it's coming up again. It'll live again. It'll thrive again. The business can thrive again. The career can thrive again. The marriage can thrive again. The relationship can thrive again. Don't you put a death sentence where God says I can bring life. Understand, John pinpoints the work of the Spirit as rivers of living water. He said in the, in the text, he said, Ooh, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of concerning, there it is, the Spirit. Um, that he who believed on him would receive for the Holy Spirit had not been given at that point because Jesus had not been glorified. Did you hear what it said? It says that out of your belly or your inner man shall flow rivers of living water. Here it is. When the Holy Spirit fills you, he doesn't fill you just to fill you. He wants to fill you so that you can become a flow. In other words, he wants to fill you, do a work in you, but also do a work through you. Remember, a river is a channel of water that's directed to a specific location. I want to tell somebody that God wants to fill you, that you become a flow, that I can direct your life and I can lead your life to strategic. It's like putting a hose on a fire hydrant. Without the hose on it, water just goes everywhere. But the soon as you put a hose on it, you can direct that water and lead it. God wants to direct you to people's lives, to people's situations, to people's circumstance. That's why your job has been so hard. It's not that the devil is up in there. It's because you were meant there not to be an employee. You were sent there to be an ambassador for Christ. And the enemy knows that you are there to be a conduit for the Holy Spirit. So the rivers of living water can flow through those dry part souls that work around you. Feel to become a flow. The Holy Spirit comes as wind. Wind, the Holy Spirit comes as. Understand that John chapter 3 verse 8 said the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit. Boy, I love this. Notice what he said. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but, can, but cannot tell where it comes from. Jesus explained that we cannot control, watch this, the work of the Holy Spirit. It blows where the wind blows where it desires. See, he works in ways that we cannot always predict or understand. See, you cannot see wind. People say, I see the wind blowing. No, you don't. What color is wind? <laughs> Catch it and paint it blue and show it to me. You can't see wind, but you see the effects of wind. Are you following me? And what he's saying is, 
when it talks about the Holy Spirit as wind, I want you to understand that we will never be able to bottle up the Holy Spirit and limit him to only doing something that our finite minds can comprehend and understand. Oh my God, he supersedes your logic and your understanding and your philosophical thinking. He's greater than that. The Bible said, oh my God, that God wants to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ever ask or think because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Uh, his thoughts are higher and his ways are higher. Come on, somebody. I'm going to go ahead and preach right here. Listen. I understand that, listen, we are in a state that was known for having some of the greatest moves of God in history. Come on. Well, for some of the greatest revivals in history, you read about them, you hear about them, people talk about them, and that's good and that is great. But can I say this? Understand that we, oh my God, you know, I got to be careful. You know, you get around people, I remember when, 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 you know, I remember when, I remember when, I remember when, well, you need a new win. You need a second win. You need to catch your second win. You know, they only can hold on to what was, but God is saying, is there a people that will believe that the greatest works of God has yet to be done. He said the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former house. Oh, come on, somebody. Oh, oh you don't hear what I'm saying. Is there anybody at Free Chapel this morning that will still believe that there are great works that can be done in California? I don't care what they say. I don't care what laws they may try to pass. I don't care where they try to discredit the church and tell us we're crazy. They can't stop the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will go up in the governmental offices. The Holy Spirit can get in the city council. The Holy Spirit can go behind bars. The the Holy Spirit is only limited when we see him with limited thinking. That's why Isaiah said, remember not the former things, neither the things of the old. Behold, I'll do a new thing. Shall you not know it? He said, he said now it shall spring forth. He said, I'll make a way in the wilderness and a river in the desert. He said, he said, listen, that's what's wrong with you children of Israel. You only see me through the eyes of repeating myself. Don't you dare reduce me. You only see me in doing what you're accustomed of me doing. I'm not going to always work that way. I'm telling you, I believe that some of the greatest moves of God may not be here on Sunday in the four walls of this church and it may not take a thousand or two thousand people. Some of the moves might just be in the gas station in the, while you're pumping gas or, or at the charging station while you're plugging up your car or it could be by while you're working out. It could be while you're cutting hair. It could be while you're with employees in your business. I think some of the greatest moves of God will not just be limited to a Sunday service but it would be poured through some believers that dare to believe God that I am a river. You can flow through me. You can use me. You can speak through me for the glory of your name and the expansion of your kingdom. <laughs> Second Kings, put this scripture up for me. He said, for thus say the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet the valley shall be filled with water so that you, listen to this, your cattle and your animals may drink. So that your, that's your dog and your cat and your animals. Let me translate that. Did you see what the scripture said? It said, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. But it said, yet the valley shall be filled with water. Wait a minute, there's no water, there's no wind, 
but yet the valley is going to be filled? Where's the water coming from? Because naturally, the only way that the water could come if rain comes down. But what God was saying, I don't need conditions to be conducive for me to move in a situation. Did you see it? I don't need everything to line up perfectly. Some of you are, I, I just got to wait for the perfect moment and the perfect, I believe timing for the perfect this and perfect that. All the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed. Uh, you know what? The economy this and the economy that. And you know, if I had more of this and if I had more of that, and if I just knew him, if I just knew her, nobody knows me. Nobody, I don't have a network. I don't have a way with that. I'm sorry that can work good sometimes and I'm sorry I believe that God can use it but don't you never limit the Holy Spirit to think you got to have everything all lined up for him to work all I need is for you to believe that I am able all I need you to believe is that I can do it you just trust me you just believe that I'll do it you let me handle the rest of it I'll call who I come on somebody the Holy Spirit can move on people's heart. The Holy Spirit can move in situations that you have no control. The conditions don't have to be conducive for God to bless you. That's right. Praise the Lord. Why don't you do that one more time? Praise the Lord. Somebody need to hear that. Somebody got free off that word. Come on. You came in saying, if I had a, if I had a, if I had a, if I had a. No. Can I give you? A, a, mm. The Bible says this, that the Holy Spirit <laughs> It comes as, as oil, too. It represents the anointing. There were three offices in the Bible that, that, that where people were anointed. There he is. Ooh. A rotisserie chicken. <laughs> oh. I'm going to have a tan line after this service. What was it? Oil, that's it. That's it. I knew, I was just saying if I was paying attention. Oil. Oil, he comes as the oil. Three, three, three offices in the scripture, really quick, that was often um, used oil to be anointed with. It was the kings, it was the priests, and the prophets. Anytime they stepped in the office, they were all anointed with oil. Can I tell you that those are offices? Hear me when I say this. I'm not saying every one of you are a prophet. Don't take that. Pastor Vaughn told me I was a prophet. But all of us operate in those types, those, those places of kings, priests, and prophets. Revelation says we're kings and priests of the Most High God. First Peter 2 says this. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Watch this. Who, who have been called to show forth or proclaim that's what it means when proclaim or speak or declare the praises or the words of God. So those are three, all you and I as the body of Christ was called as priest anointed that represents a type of intercession. The Holy Spirit will come upon you as the oil and smear you in moments of intercession to pray for people, to stand in a gap for people. There's times I could be driving down the road and somebody will come on my mind. I'll text them, I'll call them, I'll say, Lord, touch them. Lord, touch them. Lord, Lord, and I just, I just begin to pray. But then there's the oil that comes on the prophet where God knows how to put words of comfort and strength in your mouth for somebody else. But then there is the anointing upon the king which represents authority and power. And that's what we got to get back to realize as the church. Not in arrogance, but realize the Bible said you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power, number one, over the flesh. Let me start there. 
Come on. The Bible said we can walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Power is the Holy Spirit that helps you to die to your flesh. Die to that old nature and desire that wants to pull you back into old things and old ways. There is power over the flesh. Jesus did not come to save us in sin. He came to save us from sin. And he said, sin shall not have dominion over you because I've given you power. And then I got to preach this. God, there's power. Somebody need to hear me. There's power to keep you. You don't have to fall into every temptation. You don't have to stumble into everything. Come on, God is restoring. God is forgiving. God is loving and merciful and gracious. And if you do blow it, he is a forgiving God. But let me tell you something. Jude puts it like this. Now unto him that is able, listen to this, to keep you from falling. Oh God. You didn't hear what I just said. Go check your Bible. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you blameless on the day of his return. I get that God can restore, but there's also power that can keep. He can keep, oh come on somebody. He can keep you from falling in temptation. He can keep you from sliding back into old ways. He can keep you from, come on, kill going off at, with a potty mouth and cussing everybody out. He can keep you from losing your temper. He can keep you from doing unethical things. He can keep you walking in holiness and righteousness. He can keep you in peace. He can keep you in joy. He can keep you in strength. He can keep you. We serve a God that says I will give you power that keeps you. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. He kept you this week. You was about to smack somebody on the freeway. But he kept you. You was about to give him the third degree, but he kept you. Who am I talking? You know I'm telling you. You was about to say something crazy to your wife, but he kept you. Then he said power. I'm, I'm wrapping it up. Power over the enemy. Luke 10, 19 says, I will give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall hurt you. It's authority over the power of the enemy. Hear me, church. Hear me, church. The devil is real. Don't get me wrong. Demons are real. Spirits are real. I'm not minimizing that. But Jesus Christ have given the church and his believers authority over demon powers and the works of the devil. Don't you sit back and talk about the devil this, the devil this, the devil this, the devil this. Let me tell you, the devil is defeated. The devil is a liar. The devil can't stop what Jesus has started inside of me. I'm not minimizing but you've been given power to thwart the plan of the enemy. We've got to start walking in authority and declare that the devil can't have my house. The devil can't have my children. The devil can't have my business. The devil can't have my ministry. The devil can't have my career. I wish a devil would come up in here. You came to the wrong house. You came to the wrong home. You came to the wrong marriage. I've got authority. Blood of Jesus, power of the Holy Spirit, word of God, anointing from on high. I wish a devil would. You've been given power to tread upon the devil. No, I'm not trying to get an emotional height, but I get ticked off. See it. Now I'm raising teenagers. I'm telling you, the plan, I'm telling the enemy, 
if you sit back and you don't understand who you are, the enemy will wreak havoc in your home. But say, I've been given power. I said, I've been given power. The Holy Spirit gives me power. The Holy Spirit makes me bold. The Holy Spirit makes me courageous. Every one of you in this room, this is how we're going to end. I'm out of time. Got a few minutes. We said earlier, if you want more, do you want more? Are you satisfied? Are you satisfied? The Bible said this, they that thirst and hunger after righteousness shall be filled. If you're hungry, if you want more, you can have more. You have as much God as you want right now. Draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. And the way we're going to end this service, if you say, I want more, I want a fresh touch. I need a fresh outpouring. I need to be filled with the Spirit. I believe people can be filled and refilled in this audit today. All you got to do is come. You ain't got to strive for it, work for it. It's a gift of grace. The price has already been paid. Let me tell you something real quickly. Everything changed. I had two major encounters with God regarding the Holy Spirit. 15 years old, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Little Pentecostal church on the south side of Atlanta. That's it. You can start walking out because that's what I'm going to get to. And if you need to start walking while I'm talking, I don't care. I love it. That's desperation. But let me just say this. At 15 years old, I was sick mo multiple times and they could never figure out what was going on. I was having these crazy fevers and stuff going on. My mom would take me to the doctor. They knew nothing. That's it. Just come while I'm talking. Doctor after doctor, appointment after appointment, and no answers. And I start going downhill again. And my mama said, I'm tired of going to the doctor. And she said, but I want my son well. But this time, Pastor Ben, she said, before we go, we're going to stop by the prayer meeting. Not making this up. It was on a Friday. They always would have a prayer meeting in a little Pentecostal church. And when you walked in the door of that little church, there were no lights on. All you heard was people crying out to God, praying in the Spirit, bombarding heaven. You'd hear kids' names being called out. You'd hear them crying out for the city of Atlanta. you just hear these wailings of prayers going up. And my mama took me and laid me. She said, son, lay back here on the back pew. I'm going to the altar and seek God before we take you to that hospital again. As I laid back there ridden with a fever, I remember the pastor coming back. I could hear those big steps. He was a big man, about 6'5", probably 270, with a deep voice, and he was from Louisiana. He was a Cajun. And I heard him walking and praying in the Spirit. And in my little mind, I said, oh, here comes Pastor Varese. And he walked over, and I remember him laying hands on me. And when he laid hands on me, I remember something hot hit me like a ball of fire. I began to tremble and shake and break and weep and cry. And that fever broke. It looked like somebody had doused me with a tons of water. And I sat up on that back pew and I said, my God, I feel good. And by that time, I saw my mama coming and she was praying in the spirit. She was on a mission and she was come. She went and grabbed me by my hand and took me down to that altar. I fell in the altar of that church. I lifted up my hands and said, thank you, Jesus. And before I got Jesus out of my mouth, I began to pray in the spirit and pray in the Holy Ghost as the spirit gives me utterance and the Holy Spirit filled me. Now watch this. I messed up. Backslid. Got messed up. Because watch this. I didn't know how to cultivate what I had. 
I'm being honest with you. Even though you failed, you still have choice. I didn't know how to cultivate it. They told me to get it, but then it told me how to activate it and use it. So I got bound up. I got messed up. And some of you knew my story, drugs and alcohol and everything. But let me show you something. I found myself 22 years ago in the balcony of Free Chapel, Gainesville. Had attempted suicide and failed at it. But all I remember is when I sat in that balcony, when that altar call came and that, that worship started, something hit me. And it was a witness. I said, I felt that before. And at that moment, what I felt was greater than the cocaine I was addicted, addicted to. What I felt was greater than the two and a half packs of cigarettes I was smoking. What I felt was greater than the weed I was smoking at the time. Yeah, my kids are here. They know my story. What I felt was greater than the alcohol I had been pouring in my body, the acid I had been dropping, and the ecstasy I had been using. And something hit me on the inside. And you can ask my wife, I began to take earrings out of my ear and throw them in the floor. And I took my tongue ring out of my tongue. And the moment I took it out, I began to pray in the Holy Ghost again for the first time in, in years. Oh God, you're not hearing me. In years. So it reminded me there was still something there. All I needed to do was get it in an environment where the water is troubled and the spirit was being poured out and the fire was burning and God was set a fresh fire in my heart. <laughs> 